You're listening to the Hunt Suburbia Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Guyette. Big bucks I've been dreaming often. Every night till I'm in a coffin. Vermont woods to the burbs of Boston. I'm looking for a tree to get lost in. Chris Warner's little dust in the snow. Quality time, just me and my bow. Fall evenings, I know just where to go for some quality times for me and my bow. It's just me and my bow. Well, we had a pretty eventful first week of the Massachusetts opener. Um, I saw quite a bit of deer. I saw 27 deer in, in five sits. Um, brought my dad down from Vermont for three days. He um, was excited, looking forward to it all summer. Um, he's never killed a deer with his bow, so that was our goal, just uh, get dad at least a doe. And um, we had some success, so we'll talk about that. And uh, I'll touch on some things that I learned slash remembered in the first uh, first week of the season here. You know, some, some tips and and things that I think everybody should uh, should think about before you get into the swing of, uh, of deer season. Just some reminders um, that'll help you out there this year. And hey, that's it. We're going to talk about some uh, Vermont deer hunting stories, deer camp, and you know, I uh, think you guys will enjoy this one. All right, sitting here with my dad in Massachusetts. Just got done hunting three days in a row. Pretty, pretty hard, huh? Pretty hard hunting. Rough terrain. A lot of <laughs> a lot of rocks in the woods and stuff to climb over. Yeah, but we, we went at it hard. We were up early and oh, yeah. got home late. Last night we got home at 8 o'clock. Yeah, was it 8 or after? Yeah, and uh, why did we get home so late last night? Well, we had to get that uh, doe out of the woods. Yeah. My dad's first bow, bow deer was a nice mature doe last night, so that was awesome. That's so what he came down here for, get a deer. Yeah. Yeah, I was sitting in uh, my tripod spot. And set my dad up. He must not have been 30 or 40 yards away. Yeah, closer than I thought. And uh, I heard him. I heard his shot. The deer, his deer came by, thrashing through um, by my tripod. And uh, I heard what I thought was her dying. I heard her last thrash there. And that happened as I was looking at a big mature buck that was probably 70 yards, 70 yards out. Um, he just didn't come down the runway I needed him to come down. But I was watching that buck. I sent my, I sent my dad a text saying there's a, there's a big buck that I'm uh, keeping my eye on. And, um, you know, he was looking at his phone, responding to that text, and he looked up and that doe was standing right in front of him, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she made me right away. Uh, from from probably 40, 45 yards away, she she saw saw me move. She saw the movement. How how far do you think your shot was? The shot was about thirty five yards, I think. Yep, yeah. and it was a perfect shot. I mean, it just destroyed. It, it turned out to be, yeah. Yep, yeah. destroyed her. So we we got her out of the woods last night. We were back at eight. The first day, I mean, the first day he got here on Wednesday, we went out. Probably shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> we went to a uh, a place uh, a place called Nod. Uh, is what uh, some people call it, and um, just. Went, went down in there. It was a pretty big patch of woods. We knew nobody was going to bother us, especially with the rain coming. And uh, we got caught in a thunderstorm. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that, especially in the woods. The wind was coming in probably 70 miles an hour. Trees were crashing. Limbs were falling down. It got windy quick. Yeah, real real fast. So that was a, that day was a wash. Um, what did we do the next day? Next morning we went, uh, we went out to a spot. It was still pretty windy. And um, I sat my dad up on a ridge. I went all the way down the bottom of the ridge into, into the bottom there. And uh, I was hunting on the ground. He was hunting on the ground with his crossbow. And um, that was a pretty eventful morning for me. My, my dad didn't see much but some squirrels. But, yeah, I saw a lot of squirrels. Uh, that morning I was sitting on the ground um, setting up my camera, too, doing too much fiddling with my camera. Um, I happened to look to my left behind me the way that I came in and um, a doe was just emerging into a perfect spot where I could have shot her it was um, 35 yards or so and she was broadside so I saw her coming out and I reached down for my camera turned it on had to unlock my phone do all that crap 
And uh, by the time I turned back around with my camera on, there was now a buck in that spot, and a pretty good buck. I didn't get a great look at it, but it had a high rack. That buck stepped behind a, uh, a bush, and he didn't move. And I, I turned around and pivoted, pivoted around to see if I could get a, a shot off at him if they you know, kept, kept moving. As soon as I turned around, she, she spotted me, the doe that was in the front. So they really do. They pick you off pretty easy on the ground. It's tough. Pick out movement. Yeah, it was it was real tough. Well, even even not only movement, but they're so used to the area and, and their surroundings that if they see something that's different, it it, it captures their attention. Yeah, right. They they'd never seen a, a blob sitting where I was sitting. Right. And they've gone through there a hundred times. Yep. So she she picked me off. They both they both blew and ran out of there. Um, I was a little bit discouraged and sat there, and it was very windy, so I was thinking, oh, it's a good still hunting day. Maybe I should get up and still hunt. I can work my way around, maybe push something to my dad. And uh, so, I don't know, about an hour after those deer got out of there, I stood up, and as soon as I stood up, I heard a blow to my right. There was a doe and two fawns that must have been 15 yards away, and they were about to step right into my shooting lane, too. So got up right at the wrong time. They made me. They they blew. They bounded away. I actually drew back on one, um, but it was about 40 yards and quartering away a little bit too much. Um, you know, they kind of calm down. They, they blow for a little bit. They calm down. They, they, see what, they look at you and see what you're doing, try to make out what you are, and sometimes they come back. You had that happen to you last well, night. That's what happened to me last night. Yeah, she stood in front of me. Uh, well, she came into me. Like I said, she was 40, 45 yards away when she first spotted me, and she just walked right towards me. And uh, the closest she got to me was probably 15 yards. And she kept putting her head down and lifting it up and down and up and, and stamping her foot. And uh, I made the, the barest movement to take the safety off my crossbow. I just barely moved it, and she uh, jumped away. But then she turned around and came right back. And uh, another time, she just got nervous and she jumped away and ran a little bit. And then she can't turn around and came right back in again. So at that point, I decided that uh, if I had the opportunity, I would I, I would raise the crossbow s- slowly and see what she was going to do. And uh, I did that, and she took right off. But then she stopped out about 30, 35 yards and turned broadside to me, and I, I could see her outline in the in the high grass, and that's what I shot at was the was the outline. Hmm. So did it go through any of that high grass at all, or what? Well, it was just grass. It, it wasn't uh, brush or anything. So, did the arrow go through, or did the? Yeah. So did you shoot? Did you aim low, like through the grass a little bit? I I have no recollection of aiming low. I mean, she was far enough away. I didn't want to aim low, <laughs> but uh, as it. As it happened, it was a good shot. And when she was, um, did you raise your crossbow slowly while she was looking at you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah she was looking at me. Yeah. She, she, she just didn't, there were no times when she was turn away and to allow you to do that. No, no. She, she was fixated no, on yeah. it. Yeah. She, she kept watching me. And then, um, yesterday morning, we went back to the same place we went the day before that in the morning. Yeah. Um, but we both went low this time. And uh, I had a had a trail camera that we checked that first day, and it had tons of bucks um, in there, all all different, you know, six maybe six different bucks that were pretty nice bucks that were two and a half year olds to three and a half year olds, and they were all feeding on. Um, it must be a white oak there. Um, I, I set up the camera there just by accident. I set it up actually to put a mock scrape in front of it because there's a you know low hanging branch, but uh. Turns out it's a big white oak, and the deer are there feeding every night. Deer and turkeys. A lot of mornings, turkeys. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there were there was a lot of videos, only up for two weeks, and there were videos almost every day of bucks in there. So we went back the next day. I put my dad there next to that camera, and then I went back towards the trail, just backtracked a little bit, and uh, got up into a tree. And that, so I had I had a doe and two fawns come straight at me. And they went under the stand about ten yards. They're just, there wasn't, um, there were there were branches in the way right under the stand. They were that close, so I couldn't get a shot. And they were going towards my dad. So 
They went, I don't know, 20 minutes later, I heard blowing behind me. And I stood up in the stand and turned around, and I could see her doing the same thing. She was blowing, trotting off, you know, 20 <laughs> yards in one direction, and then she'd come back, come back, stomping her feet. Tail was straight out. So they do that a lot. And last night, you know, that uh, I had a fawn doing that, too, in front of me. Well, those three deer uh, came in to my right. Uh, I had uh, checked a, a distance of a tree. Well, I did it afterwards, but the deer were standing right by the tree. There were two probably last year's fawns, and the mother was, was a good-sized doe. And she she spotted me right away. I mean, she was just looking around, and all of a sudden she her, her head came up, and she staring right at me yeah, she was only 14 yards away 14.8 yards yeah as it turned out yeah and she did the same thing she uh started stamping her foot and looking at me and and i didn't move and uh eventually she kind of turned slowly and started going back the way she had come in and one of the fawns started to go with her and the other one stayed there but she never took her eyes off me, and she was in the got into the brush there, and I could hear her blowing, and uh, it, it, she probably blew at me a dozen times. Yeah, th- those does don't get as uh, distracted as bucks. No, and then she came. Uh, I saw I could see the fawns in the brush. I could see them moving, and after a while she came. She stopped and she just went went with them, and they were gone. Yeah, well, that's the problem with hunting the last few days. It's been very windy, so you can't hear anything. <coughs> you really can't hear them approach. So all of a sudden, you look up, and they're right there. Well, I didn't I didn't hear any of them. And like I said, they were 14 yards away, and I never heard them. They were just there. Were you sleeping? Be honest. No. 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 <laughs> no I, I, was, I saw them out of the corner of my eye because they came from my right. Yeah. And uh, stopped right in front of me. Yeah. But still to the right. I couldn't turn. Otherwise, I could have had the, the big doe in, in, in my scope pretty quickly Yeah, if she had come from the other direction. Well, you ended up getting a nice doe anyway last night. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Short drag, but it wasn't. It ended up being pretty tough going through a lot of the, uh, you know, there's some pricker bushes and stuff she kept getting caught in. But. Well, and the brush where she, she went into to, and, and died was six feet tall. That, it was, that, yeah. That was, that was some high brush. Like over our heads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another thing there, too. That's why I put that tripod in there. There's no mature trees, really. Yeah. And to put a, to put a full-size stand and um, sitting on the ground, you have limited limited visibility. But so last night, I saw 10 deer from that tripod. They were all over the place. Yeah. Down by the swamp. Um, at, at the end of the runway I'm looking at, but way down there where that buck was, they came from behind me. They they really they pop out of anywhere there, which makes it kind of exciting. No. Yeah. Um, and then so that and then that first day after I those those three deer I got up when I got up and I jumped those three deer out of there. I did go on a little bit of a still hunt, walked around, checked out the area. I hadn't been down down uh, in the bottom that far. So checked it out for a little bit and then circled back around that camera that I checked by the white oak. And um, I freshened up the mock scrape there just with my boot and pissed in it a little bit and and, um, went up and sat up on a rocky, you know, there's a little rocky outcrop there. Had my sandwich and, again, didn't hear anything. I just happened to look back down towards the mock scrape, you know, 15 minutes after I'd freshened it up and (laughs) there was a buck sniffing around there. You know, right next to the scrape, he was eating acorns, he was sniffing. He obviously wasn't bothered by the, the smell. And uh, I never got a shot off at him. He was he was down there for, I don't know, 20 minutes just meandering around eating acorns. And he just uh, slowly walked down through that rocky stuff and through the swamp and not up the main trail that I was, I was watching. But that was a fun day. A lot of action that day. And... Uh, I don't know. We might go out one more time tonight if we do right right in the backyard here because we're pretty beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, usually we go to Anacostia or we do some, some kind of a trip. And this year, obviously, with COVID, we can't. So, you know, maybe uh, maybe we start coming down here, get Andy and Aaron to come down and uh, do a Massachusetts on every year. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, certainly is a lot of buck sign. A lot more buck sign than I've seen yeah, in, in a long time. How many scrapes did we see today? Quite a number of them. 
and, and rubs and, and little trees broken off, laying on the ground, all yeah. scraped up. I probably saw 30 different fresh scrapes today, so they're they're out there marking. Well, you took quite a long walk around, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about deer camp a little bit. Um, obviously, where I learned to hunt and has a special place in my heart. Why don't you talk about, um, what, what do you remember about deer camp, the first the first memory you got there? Well, the first thing was uh, they they paid four hundred and fifty dollars for the camp, five of them. So for the land or the camp for the whole thing. I thought they built the. Well, they they there was one room. There was one room camp at the time, and uh, my my actual first memory was riding out on the truck. As uh, one of the guys that was in on it had an old barn, and and uh, they tore it down, and we used the lumber to add a new room. Yeah. And, and riding out on the in the back of the pickup truck on top of the lumber, I remember that. Mm. But I was uh, thirteen, I think. So when when did they build it? Nineteen fifty-eight. Fifty-eight, yeah. yeah. Four hundred and fifty bucks. Right. A place in the middle of some state forest. There's <laughs> probably five thousand acres of huntable. Well, now it is. It was uh, there was a private farm at the time. Mm. They they bought it, and it was posted. Uh, but he he let our camp hunt on it, so it wasn't any problem. What part was private there? All of it, like all, across the all, all this the state park now is, was pri- was a private farm. Hmm. How many deer were were shot back in those days? <laughs> <laughs> Not as many as should have been. You know, a lot of those guys. There were five of them, and they all weren't real hunters. They a, a lot of them just liked to get out there and uh, get away from things and play cards and. And drink so there wasn't a whole lot of hunting and, and that's when all there were a lot of deer out there yeah in the late 50s i think it was yeah 60s so i wonder who was killing all the <laughs> all the bucks back there well there there were a few shot my father yeah. shot most of them yeah i think but, well you had some guys coming up from boston right they were afraid of the woods one one guy yeah uh, he was one of the owners yeah but uh, didn't like the woods he he, he he wasn't comfortable in the woods. He had his, all his hunting stuff, and he had a, a new uh, thirty thirty, and uh, he would dress up in his hunting stuff, and he'd go out in the road and kind of walk up and down the road. And that's as far as he, he ever got. Yeah, I got a couple friends uh, from Boston area, too, like my, my friend Ross, who was just kind of scared of the woods. He gets this big... <laughs> these eyes when when you walk when you walk in i remember we gave him we went shooting a gun and i think we were shooting matt hills 30 out six and uh ross held it and like held it down by his his waist and like hip fired it <laughs> and he had this giant like his eyes were bulging out of his head look yeah some people aren't comfortable in the woods and we were just talking this morning that a lot of people on my street here they don't you know they're never in the woods you know we're in we're in suburban area here but the only time you see people in the woods, most of the time, are on the main trails and they're with their dogs or they're jogging or running, but they don't really get off the trails. Yeah. I've got a neighbor that thinks turkeys are going to kill her. <laughs> you know, she she's terrified of turkeys. But, um, yeah, so when was your first deer then at, out at camp? Your first deer wasn't at camp, right? It was... Yeah, uh, yeah, it was. Oh, it was? Yeah. I thought it was Wallingford. No, it was a... Uh, uh, they used to have doe days, and uh, they had a doe day, and I happened to shoot a doe. That was the first. What year was that? Uh, I think 61. Yeah. Something something like that. But uh, my father had always said, if you get a deer, don't try to do anything with it. He said, come and get me, and I'll, I'll help you. But he had always had me uh, gutting rabbits and stuff like that, because he'd bring them home and give them to me to do. So I reasoned that gutting a deer couldn't be that much different. So I did it myself and dragged it out to the road. And at that time, he used to leave the keys to his car in the glove, in the glove box. Mm-hmm. So I walked up and, and got the car, and I drove down and put the deer in the trunk and drove it back to camp and hung it. And he had seen me from across... One fat pond. He'd seen the car. Uh, he was hunting over there. Go down, yeah. He was hunting on the hill, and uh, it was all open, much more open now than it than it is now. And uh, a little while later, he came walking up, and then it was all done. So. 
And it wasn't much different than the rabbit? I thought you were going to say, like, no, you did it really. backwards or something. No, no. No, it was about the same. Yeah. Just bigger. Well, what, uh, what's different about... So was, you said it was a lot more open back then, just so it was a younger forest. Well, or, the, the the farmers kept it kept it cut, kept kept the roadsides uh, clear, and uh, <clears throat> it's all grown in. He had pastures down through there, and, and the pastures are all grown up now. And was that, excuse me, was that was that Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he owned all the land there. He owned it. He owned it, everything that Biggs did own. Yeah, hmm. he had a couple thousand acres there. What happened to him? He died. He died and, yeah. and had it in his will to give it to the state. Or? No, his, his his sisters got it, and his sisters lived in Bayhaven, and they moved to the farm, and uh, they heard shooting out there, and they they decided they didn't want to stay there, so they sold it to the state for twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> and that included all of Moon Fat Pond. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great park now. Oh, yeah. There. And he, he had a couple of barns, uh, hay barns, and uh, he had a house there, and the state burned them all down. But Controlled burn type thing? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we'll be out at camp now in a couple weeks. Right. 25th or something like that, whatever that weekend is around there for novice weekend. And um, we're going to have like a full camp. I don't I don't remember the last time. I don't think there ever has been a full camp in October. But we're going to have a full camp there. My, me and my buddy Evan, I'm taking him out for novice. We talked about um, Chris, who was on last week's episode, is going to come up and either bear hunt or bring his bow and bow hunt for deer. My uncle Andy is bringing out my other uncle and Gary. Yeah. And Gary's never. I mean, Gary, he's never hunted. He's like the farthest from a hunter that I, you know, that I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but that, that's awesome. He, he moved to Vermont a couple of years ago, so I think he's just starting to get, you know, get the bug a little bit. Um, well, he's willing to try it out, I guess. Willing to try it out. I think he wants to come to camp and hang out. Cause, <laughs> And our family camp has this lore to it, you know. People want to, if they haven't been and seen what it's about on a hunting weekend, they want to go. And then uh, I think Aaron's coming down with uh, his father-in-law. And uh, Jim's coming down too, so. Yeah. We have ten bunks in there. I think nine will be full. That's great. I can't wait for that. Yeah, I don't know if Andy's going or not. Yeah. <clears throat> what about, uh, what's your best hunting story at deer camp? What's your... What's your favorite, your favorite hunting story out there? Well, that that could be a tough one. I guess I guess uh, the the most unique is uh, I I hunted way back against the Malathar posted lines, and uh, the snow was knee deep at the time. Getting out there, and I, I had a little blind set up, and uh, I was sitting on a little ledge probably 10 feet high, <clears throat> and the snow was so deep you couldn't hear anything. All of a sudden, just off the tip of my feet, I could see a rack bouncing up and down, going down past me in the snow. And I I turned to the to the right because it stopped, the deer stopped and was looking down over the, over the hill. But just then a limb snapped out in the woods and he was gone. I never got a chance to get him in my scope. And uh, I, I remember him going down through the snow, and it was just a cloud of snow because it was all blowing up where he was running. And I I stayed there uh, probably another hour or two, and I could see another deer coming towards me, and it, it turned out to be a spike horn. <clears throat> and I shot that and uh, had some time dragging it out, out of the woods through all that snow. Oh, yeah. But the next day, my brother Andy shot one, shot a spike horn up there, and used my path to drag his out. <laughs> but that's when we could shoot spike horns. All right, let's get into the winner for the Trophy Ridge raffle. So if you guys remember last week, all you had to do was send in an email with a question that you would like us to answer on a uh, future podcast. So we will. I think we only got twelve questions, by the way. So. 
whoever sent in a question, thank you. And you've got a one in 12 chance of winning the, uh, the site. So that's pretty darn good. Um, we're going to go into, let's just read the question out. I'll, uh, I'll give it an answer and then we'll announce who sent that question in and that's the winner. So the question this week was, I would love to hear more about how you guys pick the best spot slash stand location to hunt big bucks. So for me, um, I think everybody knows by now I haven't killed a big buck, but this is the year that I've put the most focus into it. And what I've done that has already helped me see, I've seen three big bucks in the first week here, um, was just a lot of scouting. And it was a lot of, um, it started in the spring, went out, found a spot with a bunch of old rubs, um, didn't look like anybody was ever in there. Uh, I put up a couple cameras. I had, you know, dozens of deer in there all summer long, watched some of them grow some good antlers. Um, and I just knew that was going to be a spot that held some deer. So I, I, chose that spot as one of my stand locations but i also scouted out four or five other spots um just running a lot of cameras you know and looking for last year's rubs and a lot of last year's scrapes will still be visible starting in the spring so get out there put in your time in the off season um you know it never really does stop i'm realizing it that realizing that this year um so do a ton of scouting you know some other guys might tell you that um they find um, big sheds and they go shed hunting. That's not something I've been able to do yet, but I will start next year. Go out and look for sheds in January, February, March. And, um, if you find a a big shed, that's a surefire way of knowing there's a big buck in there and he's probably going to be a little bit bigger next year. So go out and look for some sheds. And if you find a, you know, a good one and you see some other sign in that area, target that with cameras over the summer and then, um, you know, put your stand location up. And then again, one other thing I would say is once you find that area, um, get an idea for where they're bedding there, where they're going to be eating there and what the travel route is. There should be a couple of different trails to choose from and just set your stand up 20, 25 yards off of that trail so that when they're walking on it, they're going broadside. And that's really all the advice I can give you. And without further ado, thanks to Frank Famigliette for submitting that question. And uh, you won the Trophy Ridge site. So send an email to huntsuburbia at gmail.com. And uh, I'll share with you a couple of different options that they sent us for sites. And we'll let you choose one and send that right over. So congratulations. Trophy Ridge products are intelligently designed to give you a distinct advantage and be deadly accurate. The team at Trophy Ridge believes smart, hunt-inspired innovation should be at the foundation of each product's existence. You have enough to worry about on a hunt. Your gear should not be one of them. Trophy Ridge accessories give you the comfort of always knowing you're using the best bow hunting equipment when out in the woods or at the range. For information on the all-new 2021 lineup of Trophy Ridge sights, quivers, rests, releases, and stabilizers, visit TrophyRidge.com. Trophy Ridge, the tools bow hunters trust. Okay, and for next week's raffle, we're going to go back to giving out the Elite membership to Onyx for a full one-year subscription. And all you got to do to enter next week's raffle is share the podcast on one of your social medias. Make a post about it, tell your friends about it, and uh, take a screenshot of that and email it to huntsuburbia at gmail.com to show us that you're sharing it. Uh, We really appreciate the love. Or... You can write a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're allowed to write a review. Um, Give us your honest opinion. You're not going to be discounted any points or um, your name's not going to be put at the bottom of the the drawing, I I promise you. Give us your honest opinion, um, write a review, and take a screenshot of that and email that to huntsuburbia at gmail.com. And next week we'll draw a winner for a 12-month elite membership to OnX. Yeah, what do you, so you don't like that. You don't like that law. I don't think it makes much sense. I, I think a, a Leonard Lee Rue quite some time ago, uh, my brother and I went to a seminar that he was giving about whitetails, and he said that a, a spike horn was a genetically inferior deer, that a deer should uh, go from a button horn its first year to at least a four- or six-pointer the second year. If it was getting adequate nutrition, and and I've always, you know, he's a, a naturalist and a wildlife photographer, and um, he was he was in Vermont to uh, push the doe seasons. <coughs> he's, 
a lot of people didn't want to hunt doe. But according to him, uh, you could tell by the browse lines along, just driving up into the state, look out into the trees and see the browse lines. He said, you have way too many deer. Yeah. And all they're eating, eating all the trees. Well, have you seen the browse lines on this road here? On some of the trees? I mean, it's it, it's real bad. Yeah. But yeah, you can see they're right about four feet tall. Um. So I'm going to say that there's a, I just heard of a law in some places in New Jersey, one of our listeners was telling me, that they have a earn a buck rule that they call. You have to shoot a doe first before you can shoot a buck huh. in their state. I think that makes a lot of sense. You, you hear in Vermont all the time that they want, you know, they want more does shot in certain places. Our camp especially, actually, we're in the zone where you have surplus permits all the time. Well, for muzzle loading season. Yeah, for muzzle loading season. <clears throat> yeah. But the sole purpose is to get the doe population down there. Right. Because the buck to doe ratio is all off. So that would be kind of fun if they, they're already doing the early muzzle loader season. Right. That's a doe season. Yep. Why not why not make that mandatory kill a doe before you can kill a buck? That then then you can go back you could you could even do that and not do the antler restrictions because that in itself will, will make less bucks be you know what I mean? Well, I think the, the the whole point of these people that want antler restrictions is that they feel that a spike horn is a is a young deer, and the next year it'll have a a, a rack. Mm. But the one year, uh, I, I don't remember when it was. I guess it was in the in the nineties. Uh, we shot. Uh, well, you you got one. Uh, it, 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 I like think six. Fun. Six spike horns were shot. Yeah, I think it was six spike horns. And, and one three-pointer. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, I think 80% of the deer that we've killed at our camp have been spike horns. And one of the spike horns was seven and a half years old. So that, to me, doesn't make sense. It's, yeah, that's a weird one. Yeah. Because, I mean, maybe he declined. Maybe he was an eight-pointer at one point and went back down to a spike. But it, it seems like a... It could be. seems like a quick decline. Like seven and a half is prime for a lot of deer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the argument on the other side is that you just want to give the deer more potential. You can't tell if it's genetics or, because there are a lot of deer who have great genetics who have been documented to be a spike horn when they're, uh, you know, from button horn to spike horn. And then they get to a giant, you know, giant deer. I don't think in Vermont though. Why? Because of the genetics? Well, not the genetics, but the winters, you know, the, uh, D- doing a thing like that in New Jersey or uh, some place where they don't have the the uh, s- the amount of snow that we generally get here can make a difference. I think that specific case I was thinking about was upstate New York, though, which is similar to Vermont. Oh, well, yeah, especially if it we're was, in the Adirondacks. <clears throat> it was documented, um, you know, on somebody's farm. He was just a photographer. It might have even been <coughs> Rue, but that would have been against uh, what his hypothesis was before. But yeah, they documented every single year the same buck, took pictures, they showed the progression of his antlers. And a lot of it, you got to remember, comes from the mom, too. You can't tell if the mother is carrying great genetics. She doesn't have horns to show you that. No, but it, it, it would be genetics and, and uh, the carrying capacity of, of the land. You know, what are they getting for nutrition? Yeah, one of the major differences I noticed from... Vermont, especially around our camp and like around here where we hunt, is the undergrowth. You don't, it, it does look totally different here. You get into a few spots that looks, it can remind you of camp, but there's so much undergrowth and shrubbery and right. yeah. buds and stuff. And that's like, I mean, forget the acorns. This year there's acorns everywhere. Yeah. They have abundance of food there. Plus, they have the suburban, you know, people's gardens and plants oh, sure. that they can they can eat yeah. and and there's some some farming you know there's not a lot of it but there's there's some farming around too so i mean they they have no problem here ever finding food so oh. there's there'll be 40 50 acres of, of woods that are is all undergrowth and all pretty thick stuff that they'll go in and and eat so and you don't see that up at camp anywhere no. really there is some, um, you know, there's agriculture on the other side, all the way over on, uh, yeah, we see, but really around us, there isn't. So, that, yeah, that's a major difference. 
One of the other things that Leonard Lee Rue said at, at, during this seminar was that <coughs> when deer yard up, if the yard will support, say, 20 deer, and there's 21 deer in that yard, they'll all starve. Not just the one extra, but all of them. None of them will get the, the, the amount of nutrition that they need. And he also said, and I haven't been able to uh, verify this, but I remember him saying that if a doe is carrying a, a fetus and she begins to starve, the first thing she does is that the, her system absorbs the fetus. And then once her system does that, she can never become pregnant again. Hmm. So those are all arguments. Uh, I, I, I just never saw the... Uh, verification for allowing spike horns to live and, and possibly overcrowd a yard and thereby decimate a, you know, a whole group of deer. Yeah, but you can also just shoot does to, you know, <coughs> let the spike horn live. Everybody wants to see more bucks in the woods, no matter what it is. Does, in a long, especially in Vermont, are very hard to shoot. <laughs> Once the season... Well, the spike horn, I think, is the <coughs> dumbest dumbest deer in the woods is what I've heard, you know? Yeah, there... Well, I saw a spike horn last year and, and a doe uh, just before the spike horn. They walked in front of me. The doe was on high alert, looking around, walking carefully. Spike horn had his nose on the ground, and he was just walking along. Yeah. So... And, well, it's like that little tiny four-pointer I got some footage of from my the first morning here, too. I mean, he... You know, he kind of picked me out. He he was getting close, and he was watching me the entire time, but he just kind of meandered around. He gave me a million opportunities to kill him. Yeah. As opposed to that big buck that I saw last night that just didn't. He came in, he made a noise. I'm going to show you on the phone later. He just came in, and it was like a... <laughs> almost like that. He made a weird, quick, you know, neighing slash grunt slash snorting sound there were two does there though right there were two does in front of them two big does and then i saw the does get startled a little bit and kind of trot off and right after that i heard you hear that sound it was cool hmm. i was sitting up there in my tripod shaking a little bit a little bit of adrenaline like oh man that, that's one of my target blocks <laughs> um but, yeah, different story than out at camp. Out at camp, you shoot anything that walks by that's legal. Because, I mean, there's a lot of hunters around. I think that's another reason why, you know, they don't traditionally get big at camp. You know, there's a lot of hunters. Well, there aren't anywhere near the, the number of hunters that there, there once were. There used to be a lot of people out there. Parked all over the road and, and down around the fields. And, and there were a lot of people. Now there's not anywhere near that number of people, although I think it's starting to come back a little bit. I wonder if that's just because, you know, there were more hunters when there was a ton more deer there, and now you know, people get discouraged, you know, sitting. I mean, you can go a whole year at camp, hunt hunt eight days or so, and, and see five five deer, maybe, you know? If, if you're lucky. You, you can, you, so it, it definitely can get discouraging. But, I mean, I remember in the early 2000s or late 90s, we'd see 15 deer in a day sometimes. So it just fluctuates. That wasn't that long ago, well, if you think about it. But uh, getting back to what I was saying about doe, once I think having the early muzzle-loading season is going to be good, you probably get a lot more doe than, than waiting till after rifle season to have it. Because by then... The, the uh, all the deer shook up from from hunting from the hunting pressure, and and does when you think when you think about it, a doe is the one that teaches the buck how to survive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <coughs> I mean, yeah, you'd think it would be. You know, we all get doe permits every year from muzzleloader, and we think you know it's pretty much a guarantee. And then yeah. every year it's not. Yeah, you know, to you, get to you get just one. don't see them. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I don't know if we'll be able to get up for it this year, but that'll be an interesting season. Well, and they also changed to the cross. Anybody can use a crossbow. I, I got a crossbow for that reason. I'm going to try it up there. I do love my compound bow, but um, I don't have any stand set up there. And 
it's uh those kind those woods and the spots where I like to go. It's it would be a haul even to carry a uh, a climber in there. So I'm gonna sit on the ground and try the crossbow out the day before. You it, have a lot more range with a crossbow. Yeah, you have more of a confident range. Yeah, yeah. Like I still I, I didn't have any doubts about shooting at that at doe yesterday at 35 or 40 yards, whatever she was. <laughs> I heard her blowing and I was just waiting to hear the shot sound. I was happy that it came. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, what about like kind of non-hunting stories at camp? What What's your favorite? Uh, you know, the one that always comes to mind is uh, the guys going down the road. You know, back back in the back in the day, and we obviously don't condone any kind of uh, night hunting or poaching. But sometimes that you know would happen back in the day at camp, especially the guys that didn't like to go out and uh, and hunt too much. They would be drinking in, in camp. But this is a really funny story. Oh, the camp meat story? Yeah. Well, they had it hanging out in back of the uh, outhouse. Is that the one? Oh, well, there, there's a couple where people stole, stole deer hanging off the pole back there. Yeah, that's that's happened. Which is great. That's crazy to well, me. Well, it was right down by the road, and people would just drive up. and They did that one oh, year. You guys used to hang them by the road? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, didn't uh, Steve, Steve got two stolen? Yeah. Yeah, no. I'm talking about the one down in the field where the police came and the spotlight went out. Oh yeah, they were down there picking up a doe and. Uh, oh okay. At night. Yeah. That that somebody had shot during the day. Okay. <clears throat> and they were out there in the field and they could hear a siren coming, and uh, it was a state police cruiser and it stopped right opposite them up up on the road maybe a hundred yards away, maybe maybe a little less. And he started shooting. <laughs> the police were shooting? Yeah. Hmm. And uh, I guess they were looking for somebody who was lost. But the two guys that were in the field were looking at each other saying, should we stand up? <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> Which was lucky for them. Yes. But they used to occasionally have roadblocks at either end of that road and check cars for uh, for deer. But when they'd shoot a deer, they ate it. They ate the whole thing, so. While they were at camp? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How can you eat a whole deer while you're at camp? Well, if there's. I stayed there for a week and. Five or six of you, and they're staying there two or three days. You. Get a small deer. <laughs> well, they, they, weren't, they weren't shooting any monsters. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, but lately, though, you know, since the spike horn rule, you have to admit, it's been. Bigger, bigger bucks at camp. Well, the does are bigger too. That's the thing. It's it's uh, the winters haven't been as bad. Yeah. And and that affects the survival rate. Uh, you still see the small ones. That was a spike horn I saw last year. And <clears throat> yeah, I think every year since the spike horn law, I've had a spike horn walk up to me. I've had I've had uh, it's three that I can think of. You can shoot a three pointer, yeah. I've yeah. had a three pointer too, but it was just that tiny little fork, and you yeah, don't yeah. you don't know what to do. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the last three pointer I shot, I thought was a spike horn, but it had a little kicker coming off the base. Yeah. And, and I would have passed it up uh, since they made the the law, but yeah. And we've been seeing a lot more bears at camp, so bears. A lot of bears. Bears weren't there for how many years? Because didn't Andy see one in the 80s or something? Yeah, my father saw one one time, and it was always a big deal. You know, they saw a bear. Andy saw one on a tree during bow season. And uh, What year was that? This, this, was, uh, this would have been probably in the, in the 70s, early 70s. Well, yeah, it would have been maybe 75. Yeah, and then we didn't see any bears until from then. Right? Right. I don't know of anybody that's all Until, old. what, 2015 or something? The last <laughs> five years? Yeah. Five, six years, they've been coming back. And uh, no one's got one yet. I think no. three of us have shot at them. Yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. Something about them that's very tough. Um, Chris from, from Big Woods Box says just shoot them right through the shoulder. You know, we were thinking you had to wait for the shoulder to 
the yeah. front the front leg to go forward and all right, that stuff. Right, he said right. just shoot him right through the front shoulder. <laughs> They should die. I don't know what what was happening. That first one, how close was he to you that you shot? Well, the first time I you, shot... You had the first sighting of a bear, right? Since I'm, 75, I think that shot was the... It might have been. No, I think uh, Andy had already shot at one. Oh, did he? But uh, it, when I first saw it, it was about 100, 100 yards away or more, going from my left to my right, and I took a pot shot at it, and it turned and came right towards me. Which kind of amazed me. <laughs> and uh, I was up on a cliff, and I got another shot when he was down below me. And by the time I worked the, the bolt on my 270, he was up there with me, about 10 yards away maybe. Jeez. <clears throat> but he was, he was hidden except for his hind quarters. And I wasn't going to shoot him in the hind quarters, and he stopped. And I'm looking through my scope, and all of a sudden... Bang, he took off, and he went right up over the top of that ridge. I had one more shot when he was running, and we never found any sign that I hit him. But you shot him at 10 yards? No, he, I didn't shoot. He was oh. stopped there. All I could see was his hind, hind end. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, and I then I, I had, I've had two different shots at bears. One was climbing almost up a sheer cliff that time I was sitting at the bottom of uh, that, that gut there. And there's a rock face cliff, and I heard a racket coming down, and uh, kind of came down the gut face, and then stopped and just climbed up that rock face. It was crazy, and I was I sh- shot at him going up that thing, but I went, I I even climbed up that, and uh, I found one tiny little speck speckle of blood. That was it. So I don't know something about them, but some, one of these days somebody's gonna get one at camp. Yeah, that'll go on the list. Well, we got the big one on the. It's on the camera. Oh yeah, that one's huge. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any idea how to judge how big a bear is by that, but he looked like a three hundred pound bear to me. Three or bigger. He was yeah. He had an awfully big head <clears throat> and, a, and a big, big body on him. Yep. Well, maybe next year we'll go uh, and do a bear hunt instead of a a deer hunt somewhere. Go and do a bear hunt. Yeah. Try to get one. And uh, moose, you went on a moose hunt once, right? I didn't. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I, 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 that's right. Dan. Well, Dan got had, the tag. And had he the went. tag. Yeah. Yep. Well, there there are a lot fewer moose now than there were because of the ticks. Yeah. And yeah. The, the warmer it gets, and the uh, the more ticks there are, unless it's dry like it was this year, and yeah. they seem to be fewer. Look, I hate ticks. You hate ticks. I know you hate ticks. I know your parents hate ticks. I know your kids hate ticks. We all hate ticks. You know what I want to do to ticks? I want to kill them. You know how you do that? Sawyer permethrin. Not only repels ticks, keeps them off your clothes, but if they do happen to get on there, it'll kill them. They only have to go over an inch and a half of your clothing that's been treated with Sawyer permethrin to die. What's better than that? Maybe killing a big buck, but this is a close second. These guys are an amazing company. They're U.S. based. They're family owned and operated. Look for the yellow bottle. You can find them in Cabela's, Bass Pro Shop, Dick Sporting Goods, Moose Jaw, REI. Find them online. Whatever you got to do, get Sawyer Permethrin. It is not expensive. It'll save your life from these diseases that ticks carry. And it's a quick application. You spray it on your clothes, spray it on your hat, put it on your socks and shoes, put it on your backpack. Let it dry outside in the breeze, and it dries odorless. The deer are not going to pick you off from putting this stuff on your clothes, I guarantee you. Get Sawyer Permethrin. You won't regret it. Up in Maine, they, they, they find dead moose all the time with thousands of ticks on them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That just are, yeah, they're decimated. They, they kill the young ones, you know. Yeah. More often. And um, that product that you gave me as a gift, Sawyer, that's now a sponsor, they, um, I I was talking with them and I was like, I mean, the Big Woods Bucks guys up in Maine, they talk about all the time about how the um, the moose are getting decimated by ticks and and ticks are the main source of of uh, of moose deaths up there, and um, you know they had they had to sponsor those guys because it's, I mean, just a terrible thing. You don't want moose dying from that. Well, and and they're on most of the deer, also, but they 
some reason they don't seem to be affecting the the deer that much. Yeah, or at least I don't know. We don't notice it as much because they're highly populated. But yeah, I, I don't know. I thought I saw one tick on your doe last night, you know, by her ear, but I didn't see very many. If there were any on her, well, I saw that one. I thought you were looking at when I looked at it closer. It was just some piece of dirt or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if she had any. I mean, I haven't had a tick on me. No. Um, back in the spring, I was going out scouting behind the house and just looking around. Looking around at stuff, found a couple deer skeletons from coyotes and and stuff back there. And uh, I was wearing shorts and, you know, just being kind of an idiot out there. And I'd come back with five or six ticks on me. Mm. Or I'd look down and I'd be flicking off a dozen of them. But uh, as soon as I put on the Sawyer stuff, you never get any ticks on you. No, not only that, but, if, but mosquitoes won't bother you either or, or uh, black flies. Yeah. I've noticed... I've got a shirt that I treated with the permethrin, and I'll always put it on when I go out to camp in the summertime. And I hear them, and I have my hat also treated. And I'll hear mosquitoes all around me, but none of them land. How many years have you been using that stuff? A couple. Yeah, and it's been great since. I haven't had any, any ticks. I had uh, five ticks on me one year the last time I had any ticks on me. Yeah. Well, if I could kill two species, it'd be ticks and yellow jackets, you know? <laughs> and I hate those things. But, um, all right, what do you think? You want to go out this evening and do one more sit behind the house or hang well, out? Probably ought to do either one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll wrap that one up then. Okay. All right. Yep. Thanks, Dad. You're welcome. All right, we're going to do a little segment called Things That I Learned. And this is going to be from... The first week hunting, you know, getting back into the swing of things, um, shaking off the rust a little bit, and uh, just just some things that I noticed from the first week, things that I may have learned or remembered again, um, things that I didn't remember, uh, and I hope it's going to help you guys as you're preparing to get into the swing of things here um, for your deer hunting season. So the first thing is <laughs> hunt bad weather. If you want to hunt bad weather, hunt it. But if it says severe thunderstorms, don't go out. <laughs> My dad and I went out, I think it was Wednesday night. There was a, a crazy storm that came in. It showed like 30% chance of coming in. So I, I took the gamble and he and I went out and hunted that afternoon. It was it was, it was was pretty beautiful for uh, the most of it. And then all of a sudden this storm came in and it came in with a temper and it was not fun. There were giant trees falling everywhere. I mean, it was probably 70 mile per hour winds lightning striking around us, giant limbs falling off. My dad had a couple of branches hit his head. Luckily, they weren't big limbs. Um, and torrential downpour. I mean, it got bad fast. 20-degree weather drop. Um, you're not going to shoot a deer in that weather. And, your you know, your chances of shooting one right before that, you know, they're not that great, and it's not worth it. So if you see severe thunderstorms in the forecast, maybe just, just stay home. Um, it, it really wasn't that fun, so... That's number one. Number two, um, don't forget stuff. Like I forgot one one sit, I forgot my pull up rope for my bow. Um, brought my climber out and just didn't have the rope to pull my bow up. Forgot my flashlight. Um, so I you know got down a little bit earlier that night to get out um, while it was still light. I was hunting the edge of a swamp. It gets real dark in there um, quicker than um, hunting other places a lot of the time. So don't forget your stuff and you know just keep a checklist. That's the only way you're going to make sure that you have everything that you need for the hunt. Um, you will forget stuff, but if you have a checklist, you go through it real quick. It'll take you two or three minutes before you go out. Make sure you got every single thing that you need. You know, don't don't forget your knife. Don't forget, definitely don't forget your license and your tags. Um, there's a lot of little things that it's easy to forget. So just make a quick checklist and run through it before you go out. Number three. No matter how many times deer might spot you or blow at you or spook and run away and you think that you're not going to see any deer for the rest of the day because of it, and they alerted every deer within a mile radius, it's just not true. Um, they might, you know, put a couple of deer on high alert for 10 minutes or so, but um, this happened a couple of times this first week. I've had deer spook. I was going into my stand. I, I jumped... Uh, something that was bedded right next to my stand blew at me in the dark and I'm sitting there thinking everybody does it. Oh man, this, this that's probably going to blow my hunt. 
but I saw 10 deer that day. The deer were coming in from everywhere. So don't let that discourage you. Um, also the first morning I was hunting with my dad, I had a doe and a buck sneak up behind me and I was hunting from the ground and, uh, I turned around and looked at him and I saw the doe. I didn't even see the buck at that point. I saw the doe enter an opening and, uh, started fiddling with, with my phone to try to get, uh, Instagram live on. And by the time I turned around in that spot where the doe was, there was a pretty nice buck standing right there. Um, and I pivoted around, um, the buck was behind a bush. I thought I was safe and I forgot about the doe. Don't forget about the doe. She's going to be watching you. She's much more alert than a buck. The buck's distracted. So many times the doe is going to be the one that, that picks you off. So that's another thing. If you got a deer that you're trying to shoot and you know, there's other deer in the area, you got to know where all of them are and if their heads are up and when you can move and when you can draw and all that stuff. So, um, pay attention to all of them. But bottom line is they spooked. I got a little bit discouraged about how I sat for another half hour and I decided to get up and do some still hunting. As I was getting up, there were three does. Uh, I think it was a, a mother and two skippers. Um, they were 15 yards away. As soon as I stood up from my spot, they blew at me and they, they, you know, got out of there. Um, and there I am again, getting a little bit discouraged, but I went on a little still hunt. Uh, I made that mock scrape and um, this is point number four peeing in your mock scrapes so far from what i can tell isn't gonna hurt i peed in a mock scrape i freshened it up i changed my card in, a, in one of my cameras i had in that spot and 15 minutes later I, I shit you not 15 minutes later a buck walked up and he was an eight pointer he wasn't a huge eight pointer but he was an eight pointer walked up put his nose right in that scrape sniffed around and then casually ate acorns for 25 minutes or so in front of me he was just browsing um, I was on the ground and I didn't have a shooting lane at him. And if he kept walking on that main trail, it would have been broadside at 20 yards, but he didn't. He took a different trail and kept brush between us. But listen, um, I can say that's the first time that I've sat, peed in a scrape and, and had a deer come up, let alone a buck. Um, I think he, I don't think he was attracted to the scrape. I think he just came in and he was, he was headed that way anyway. There's a nice big white oak tree there and he was eating on those acorns, but it didn't scare him away. So don't be afraid to pee in your mock scrapes. At least give it a try and, um, you know, put a camera up on it and that'll tell you if they're, you know, really, uh, don't like what you're pissing or what. Um, number five, when you're hunting on the ground, you really do need, make sure you got a big tree that you can conceal yourself. And I should have known interviewing John coffee last week. This is what he told me. You got to have a big tree or a root ball. And, um, I was kind of an idiot that day. I was sitting in, you know, I had some background of some thick brush that I thought was going to conceal me, but it doesn't, you need, you need, you need something solid to be in front of you to be able to turn and set up for a shot. I got picked off two times by two different sets of deer that day for, you know, pivoting around, um, that buck who was sniffing my mock scrape. I, I did have a chance because I was behind a big split tree with a V in the middle, which was pretty nice. I was going to shoot right through the V, but he just uh, didn't walk the way I needed him to. So if you're going to try hunting on the ground, make sure that you do have a big root ball or a big tree, something that can help conceal you. And then, um, finally, one thing I want to talk about is just like when you're hunting in the suburbs, enjoy your spots, but just know that your spots can be taken away at any point, unless it's like conservation land and you know, it's going to be there for a long time. If you're hunting private, you can get a new owner come in. Um, they can sell the property. Um, there can be a, an anti-hunter, you know, next door who lobbies with the, you know, the private landowner um, or worse, it, your land can get developed. Um, there's a spot that I've been hunting. Actually, it's last year where I got my five pointer, my first bow buck. That spot I went in there a couple weeks ago for the first time. It's got excavator tracks in there and they're doing perk tests and Listen, it's probably going to get developed. I saw that it was for sales, like 50 acres. Um, it's probably going to get developed. So, you know, that sucks, but you got to move on. And that's why you got to have multiple spots that you're scouting. And um, don't get discouraged. That's that's just the way it is in the suburbs. Um, if you don't like that, I mean, you obviously can go to bigger woods. I love hunting bigger woods. Um, find bigger patches of woods. Hunt only conservation land. But if you're going to hunt private are you going to hunt, you know, close to towns and um, in some of these areas that you really don't have any other choice? Don't get discouraged if uh, if your spot gets developed or you got to move on. So 
that's it. I hope uh, I hope those tips and pointers help you guys and uh, straight shooting and get some deer and give me a call and let's do a, let's do a couple of uh, kill episodes. Thanks for listening to the Hunt Suburbia podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We're going to release an episode every single Sunday throughout the season, throughout the entire year, and we will possibly be releasing some bonus episodes here and there. Um, throughout the week as people you know come in freshly off a bow kill and tell their stories we hope that happens throughout the season Um, there might be weeks where you get two or three bonus episodes you might not get one for a couple of weeks but there will be some bonus episodes but you can count on us every single Sunday to have uh, a new interview on throughout the season Uh, once again thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next week big bucks I've been dreaming often Every night till I'm in a coffin Vermont woods to the burbs of Boston I'm looking for a tree to get lost in Chris Warner's little dust in the snow Quality time, just me and my bow Fall evenings, I know just where to go For some quality times for me and my bow It's just me and my bow